Hi, I'm Leighton Hughes, FinTech Lead for the CSFI, uh, the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation. Uh, delighted that this month for our FinTech review, we have uh, Jemima Kelly, who is our long-standing anchor for the series. Uh, Jemima is a uh, reporter uh, at FT Alphaville. She writes on the Financial Times and recently about uh, cancel culture, uh, the Wuhan lab leak theory, and I think on jet engines or something uh, similar. Uh, but she covers uh, blockchain and crypto and fintech more broadly. Uh, uh, she, uh, she's previously been at Reuters and The Economist. Uh, delighted that this month uh, we have Varun Paul, the head of the fintech hub at the Bank of England. Um, Varun has been at the Bank of England for almost 13 years. Uh, which seems like a really long time, uh, and uh, he's been uh, he's, he's he's as I said currently head of the fintech hub, but he's worked as a senior manager on the uh, Future of Finance report, uh, which was uh, of course headed by Hugh Van Steenist, uh, a good friend of the CSFI, and private secretary to Andy Haldane uh, and many other impressive roles at the bank. Uh, he is a graduate of Cambridge and and UCL. Uh, yeah, that's the sort of uh, this is our panel. We have no Andrew today. And there's no Andrew this month, uh, and he sends his very best wishes. Uh, but he has um, given me um, an objective, and that is to um, talk about the IBM dollar very, very briefly. Um, so Edward de Bono um, passed away last week, and he wrote a paper um, in March 1994 for the CSFI, uh, which... Uh, Again, it seems a very long time ago, uh, but it, it makes it even more impressive because this was sort of a very prescient work on private currency uh, and digital money. And I think it's a really, really interesting paper, and I encourage all of you to uh, go, and, go and have a look at it. It's on our website. Uh, Edwin de Bono was founded sort of lateral thinking, um, and you know, the, F, the FT uh, was... Uh, there was a very um, an obituary that Andrew uh, really wanted to uh, follow up on, and that was just to say that uh, Edward uh, was a very innovative thinker. You know, thinking about these issues, um, you know, well in advance, you know, decades before uh, before uh, it was sort of top of the agenda of our central banks, and yeah, uh, and it decades before also, blockchain. Decades before blockchain. And also this report uh, that Edward gave uh, to the CSFI was completely free. And it was just when we were starting out. So a gentleman and uh, an innovative thinker, uh, that's, the, that's the record. But I, I do encourage you to uh, have a look at it. And uh, it's, as I say, it's on our website. Um, yeah, uh, there's so much to cover. Um, I thought I would just give it over to uh, Varun first uh, to talk about the Bank for International Settlements Collaboration, CBDC, and of course the uh, SME data uh, exchange. Um, and I think, yeah, really be great to hear if, if Jemima has any thoughts on that as well, and then we'll kick off into the, into the agenda. Thanks, Leighton, um, and thanks for having me here today. Um, as you say, I had, I had the FinTech Hub at the Bank of England, and I thought I'd take a moment to just tell you a little bit about how the FinTech Hub works at the Bank of England and what the Bank of England is doing in this space at the moment. So, as you may know, uh, the Bank of England's mission is to promote the good of the people of the United Kingdom by promoting, by ma maintaining monetary and financial stability. And we, we genuinely look to embrace FinTech to deliver that mission in three ways, I guess. by supporting the safe adoption of new technology and finance uh, by uh, enabling payments fit for a digital age and by influencing the interaction between the digital economy and finance. Now, as the name suggests, we operate a hub and spokes model within the bank. Um, and that's because as fintech developments have become more mainstream, it's become more important to think about fintech kind of as part of BAU as business as usual. Um, so we've been building expertise in fintech in every part of the bank. And they're the kind of spokes. Um, and then the FinTech Hub uh, is the center of expertise. So on most topics, we're working hand in hand with experts around the bank, uh, people I've worked with over my time at the bank uh, in this long 13 years, as you described. Uh, and then in terms of engaging with the FinTech industry, you can think of us in the FinTech Hub as the kind of eyes and ears of the bank. So let me give you a flavor of things 
that are keeping us busy at the moment. I'll start with AI, if that's okay, where uh, our objective is to promote the safe adoption of AI in financial services. We launched the AI Public Private Forum in collaboration with the FCA at the end of last year, and we're working with our 21 experts to understand the opportunities and the challenges of AI and machine learning. Last qu quarter, we focused on data. This quarter, we're exploring model risk management, and our learning has come on a huge amount already as a collective. And next quarter, we're going to turn to governance. Second, uh, you've already mentioned it, the BIS Innovation Hub. Um, we were selected as a location for one of the new BIS Innovation Hubs, which we formally la launched last week. It's, it's a really exciting opportunity to partner with the BIS, to, to lead from the front on enabling fintech innovation, um, and also to use the BIS network to collaborate with other innovation hubs around the world. So that's an exciting bit of work that's just getting started really in earnest and will be a long, a year long, uh, two or three year long project. Then uh, in terms of the interaction between the digital economy and finance, we've, as you may know, been long supporters of open banking and we're working closely with colleagues at Bayes and the FCA on smart data, on open finance. And we continue to champion our proposal from the Future of Finance report uh, for an open data platform that would essentially harness the power that we've seen of permission data sharing from open banking, but take it further to boost SME access to finance at what is really a crucial point in the economic recovery. Finally, I'll mention digital currencies, which the work has been led by some of my colleagues, uh, but we've been closely involved. Uh, and last week, we published this discussion paper on new forms of money in which we set out our thinking on stable coins and central bank, central bank digital currencies. I'm sure we'll get into more of that detail uh, either from questions from you or Jemima, but uh, let me stop there uh, in the interest of time. And see if well, I was going to ask about the, um, the new BIS um, Innovation Hub in the UK, because it talked about that being um, part of, you know, what, the, 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 there being four other hubs. Are those, yeah. is the UK, where, does, where has the UK come in the like pecking order of that, I guess? I wondered like <laughs> what that said for... Yeah, yeah. Number one, of course. Yeah, it's Australian. Um, um, so what... what <laughs> The way it's worked is there was there was two phases. The first phase uh, had innovation hubs in Hong Kong and in Singapore mm -hmm. and Switzerland, and we're we're the first to launch in the second phase. So okay. in this phase, we've got the UK, we've got Canada, we've got one that's split between uh, Germany and France, and we've got one in Scandinavia. Oh, that's uh, so we're, okay. so yeah, we're yeah exactly. Those are the four. Europe. Yeah. And what, well, no, sorry, we had, we had Switzerland as well, so it's, so it's the first in this new phase. Um, is this a sort of, I mean, this is a coordination hub, uh, right? So, I mean, what sort of, what is top of the agenda for, the, for this collaborative, collaborative unit? Uh, and where will it be based? I mean, is it in the cloud? <laughs> so actually, physically, it's going to be based in the bank. Um, we're going to be, we've been working really closely with them uh, on this. Um, and in the launch, Ben was talking about it being really about more practical than hypothetical things. So it's about delivering potentially things like proofs of concepts um, to, to, to really make progress on fintech. And fundamentally, as I said before, it's kind of to support private innovation. And, and then there are collaboration really is between other centers around the bank, uh, around the world where there is other expertise. For example, in Hong Kong, they've been using distributed ledger for uh, trade finance. Uh, and in Singapore, they've been focused on digital ID. Now they want to look at things like um, open finance APIs, uh, green finance, um, and start tech and reg tech. So there's a few different things that they want to focus on. And we'll be working with the BIS to, to identify the work plan for the London Hub in the next few weeks and months. I know that um, John, Sir John Cunliffe um, has said that you know, cross-border payments are a real priority. Uh, you know, six out of 10 uh, B2B payments uh, requires manual intervention, which I still find shocking. Um, I was just wondering, um, obviously you, you can't talk about it too much, but uh, how, how important will BIS be in the CBDC debate? Um, and I know that uh, Andrew Bailey spoke about this at the launch yesterday. Uh, obviously, it's a hot topic. Um, yeah. Yeah, so definitely the BIS is going to be important and it is one of the topics uh, that they, they will be exploring through the innovation hubs. The other bit from our perspective is that the G7 is very, very uh, much involved. So it's going to be a collaboration across many different countries and developed worlds um, to explore how 
central banks and digital currencies can uh, facilitate the, the economy in the future. And, and in particular, that, that cross-border use case will be important. But even before a, a digital currency, you know, we've got the, C, uh, the CPMI task force um, leading on, on ways to improve cross-border payments uh, using existing technologies too. So there's plenty of work uh, that the, the BIS is leading on that. Did you have any thoughts, Jemima? Well, uh, do, do we want to go on to the discussion paper on um, on digital money and and what I thought it was kind of interesting what Bailey said in his speech on on Tuesday about um, about crypto assets. Did you did you see this, um, Varun, when he said he said stable coins are distinct from crypto assets such as Bitcoin, which have no backing and thus no anchor to provide stability of of value. But crypto asset is not money, hence the term cryptocurrency is misleading. Yeah, I would actually argue that crypto asset is also a bit misleading even um we don't call gambling like we don't call a bet um an asset like when you buy like when you put money on a bet that's not like an asset is it um anyway uh it has no intrinsic value because it has no backing it can have extrinsic value in the sense that people can collect and own them just as they like to collect and own all sorts of things but that extra extrinsic value is highly unstable and could be nothing um Anyway, so I, that was quite an interesting um, speech, and I thought that this this discussion paper was kind of interesting. It sets out five um, core principles, um, among them financial inclusion being a prominent consideration, competition, obviously. Importantly, I think the third one is the bank should assess whether non-CBDC payment innovations could deliver the same benefits. Like, to what extent can a central bank issue digital currency? be delivered by private sector proposals, which I do think is always like, almost like a bit of a missed um, question when, when people talk about blockchain as well. It's like that people forget to kind of answer like why, you know, it's always like how and what can we do and what solution, um, but it's never like, what, why do we want, why do we need you know, and this. Uh, and then the privacy obviously is an important um, factor. And then the fifth one should do no harm in terms of monetary and, and financial stability. So that's kind of, um, those all seem quite sensible, don't they? I mean, I don't know if any, yeah. did you, did, so you, did you, did you, um, were you part of this, this? Um, so I've worked not directly on the speech, but uh, we've, I've worked with people leading on the CBDC stuff for a while. Um, but what, what I really like, yeah, either one, yeah. What, what I really liked about where we've got to in the last week uh, is that we've set out uh, some some fundamentals uh, and some core thinking, going back right to what is money, what is the role of central banks in money, and why we would do that. And I, that's been really instructive for me to think about the distinction between central bank money, which you know, households and customers and businesses have access to in the form of banknotes versus commercial money, commercial bank money, um, where, you know, we're held by, the, held by the public in bank accounts. And, and what this is saying is, should we, given that there's all this innovation in stable coins um, and clearly interest, is, is it possible that the central bank can provide a digital currency in a safer and more effective way? Mm -hmm. And therefore, should we be giving uh, households and businesses access to electronic forms of central bank money? Yeah. Um, and, and that is crucial because what we're saying is it's the ultimate risk-free form of money. <clears throat> it's the form of money that people have most trust in. And so is there a role for that? And, and let's explore that. And absolutely, you're right. I mean, we haven't answered. There's loads of questions, right? And we're at the start of this. And we've launched uh, a, a CBDC task force with the Treasury to explore some of this. But you, you're right. We've talked about inclusion. We've talked about privacy uh, as really core priorities. We've also said that we need to be able to um, to to uh, use it as a platform for innovation, and those are really important principles for me. Um, it, there are certainly opportunities here, and um, the one you touched on at the end is uh, I don't know if you mentioned that um, uh, principle as well, but this idea that there are other opportunities out there. So do no harm to monetary and financial stability. But mm -hmm. one of the bits of feedback we got from our uh, discussion paper. Uh, consultation paper last year was that also don't forget that there could be new opportunities here, um, whether it's for the transmission of monetary policy or for resilience and financial stability. So, yeah. so make sure you consider that as well. Um, but absolutely, you're right. I mean, it, it was it was great to hear the governor. I'm sure uh, other people have thought about this in terms of the distinction between crypto assets or currencies 
um, stable coins, and then what the role of the central bank might be uh, as an alternative uh, alongside uh, the spectrum of payment options. Mm. I did just have a, a point uh, to make about uh, Governor Bailey said, uh, you know, critical innovation has been the key here. Uh, you know, not not gung ho innovation, or you know, there's a clear framework. And I mean, it, this is still right at the beginning of the process, right? And you know, there I know, um, you know, there, it seems to be responses to a paper, which was a response to another paper, yeah. and uh, it's a very long process. Uh, it just shows the complexity. Um, I was just wondering, could you have a um, just a quick word on the um, SME finance and, you know, what, what are the next steps on that? Yeah, sure. So this is something that's close to my heart. <clears throat> um, we, uh, as I said, we've seen the benefits of open banking. And uh, for, for, for me, what it does is it's giving, putting the power of data in the hands of the user. And so what we explored is this idea that you could get much more data together to fill what is, I think, a really key information asymmetry in the SME lending market. It's the most acute in that market because of the degree of heterogeneity uh, and the uncertainty and the, and the risk. And so if you can bring data to bear, we think it makes it better for lenders. They understand the proposition better. And you've got no longer got this stranglehold from the incumbent bank. So you're opening up the market to competition. But crucially, and this is, hasn't been done before, you're enabling SMEs to actually share their data and you're making it easier for them to shop around for credit in a way, as I said, hasn't been done before. And we think economically that's really important. Um, we think for the first time, you know, it's a long-standing problem. We think data and technology are enabling that to be a possibility. And so we're working with uh, colleagues at FCA and Bayes and Treasury to explore whether there's more we can do, given that it's, it's such an important part of productive finance as well. Uh, and as I say, really important moment uh, in terms of the economic recovery. So um, we'll see what the next steps are on that, but it's something we're certainly championing. But you'd think the incentive for participation would be high as well. You know, there's clear, you know, knowledge is is key. So you'd think it would yeah. make a lot of sense. And and unlike <clears throat> open banking has always been criticized by the banks for being one directional travel of data. Um, and, and I think what you get if you bring the whole system together in a kind of smart data economy is that the banks benefit too from a much reduced cost in KYC on and onboarding. Other, other parts of the system benefit from data to, to get a more rounded picture. And there are a few key, key intermediaries. We've already seen the third party providers in open banking, but the cloud accounting software providers also sit on a treasure trove of data for the SME. So if the SME can use that uh, as a gateway to share more information about their business, you know, with their own permission, they get to choose, they're in control. But if they want to share that, they might get access to new services, innovative um, and more d diverse and competitive uh, services and offers. So, so that's, I think, where the future will go. Um, and the question is how we get there, because it really it just requires a lot of coordination in order to, to make this a competitive platform. In the same way that we talked about a competitive platform for digital currencies, that's where we see our role uh, to, to facilitate private innovation. Right, there's so much to get through. Jemima, you have... Yeah. Okay, I'll move, I'll move through. So from one, from one sovereign state to a slightly smaller one, El Salvador. Um, so obviously we might all know by now, um, they have uh, made Bitcoin legal tender. Um, so what that means is um, until now they... Uh, they got rid of their own currency a while ago, so they've been using a dollar system, uh, and they now ostensibly as a part of kind of um, reducing reliance on the dollar um, have said that Bitcoin will be, um, you know, all, all merchants will have to accept it because this is legal tender. Um, and it's led by the 39 year old president of El Salvador, a guy called Nayib Bukele, who um, uh, has put laser eyes on his um, on his Twitter profile, which is you know a signifier that you are part of the kind of cult uh, of Bitcoin. Um, obviously, all the kind of rhetoric is about you know financial inclusion. Um, he's apparently you know El Salvador actually um, its energy mix is very um, very green. It has, has a lot of geothermal energy and hydropower. And apparently he's going to build a whole new, you know, um, I've forgotten if it's geo or hydro 
power plant to to um, to power Bitcoin mining, and he's going to be very welcoming to all sorts of kind of crypto businesses. Um, I mean, <laughs> I don't really know what to say. I mean, it, it's funny the way that the. Um, I mean, clearly, as we've discussed on here lots of times, you know, Bitcoin, and and as Andrew Bailey has said, Bitcoin is 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 really doesn't is really not a currency, even so. It's a bit of a misnomer to kind of imagine it as such, and so therefore, a country kind of accepting it as a currency is quite an interesting move. Um, I mean, you just got to like think, got to think about like how volatile it is, and I mean, would you want to? I mean, these merchants have to accept Bitcoin. You like think about the risk that they're taking and just having to accept that. And what happens when someone wants to return an item? Do they get that? Do they get the refund in Bitcoin or in dollars? And what if Bitcoin has like halved in price? Do they then get like half of the Bitcoins? Or the, like who, who takes on that risk? And why would you take on that risk? Like as a merchant, you're forced into it. But as a consumer, why would you choose to do that? And if this is really about financial inclusion, which I mean, that's just you know, a word that I can't use. Um, why, why Bitcoin? Like there are so many other ways of increasing financial inclusion. Even if you wanted to do the crypto way, which I don't feel that you would need to, you could do it with a stable coin because, you know, you can give people access to a digital dollar without giving them a bank account, right? So like they could have a stable, they could have a, a digital USD, which is stable, <laughs> um, which could, 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 could be used to facilitate that. Or you could give them mobile money because actually the lie, of, the lie of this is that like you need, as far as I know, you need, in order to have a digital wallet, you need a smartphone. The beauty of um, mobile money is that you don't even need a smartphone. Like you can just have a five pound, five dollar, um, you know, basic, very basic mobile phone, which um, I, I, I don't know the stats in El Salvador, but in a lot of poor countries, many people, I mean, now lots you know, smartphones are very widely owned as well. But if people aren't wealthy enough to have a smartphone, then they then they have a, a cheaper phone and you can use that for mobile money transfer. So you don't even need to um, to have a smartphone. Whereas with Bitcoin, you actually need a smartphone. So it seems to me that like, this is only solving financial inclusion for the people who already have enough money to have a smartphone, right? Uh, and so it's just like, it's, 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 it's not financial inclusion. This guy's a Bitcoin bro. He thinks it's he thinks it's a fun idea to 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 bring this. I mean, clearly, like some people, some you know, this is one of the arguments for it. But it's like it you can unpick that argument so quickly and find other ways of doing it that it just makes absolutely no sense. But obviously, the whole of Bitcoin land embraces it because they literally all they care about is number going up, right? So like if the president of El Salvador wants to make it legal tender, that's going to be bullish for Bitcoin. And so they're going to say, yes, this is great, even though the, the, their whole philosophy is supposedly about, you know, getting around the nation states, but suddenly it embraces a nation state accepting this as legal tender because it's just so wildly inconsistent and it's just about pumping the bags. Um, and I mean, like, what would happen if, like, Kim Jong Un suddenly said that he is going to accept Bitcoin as legal tender? Like, would they? I mean, yeah, they would. They would. They would just, you know, they hate Elon now because Elon is now like saying some slightly more negative things about Bitcoin. It's just, I mean, it's just silly, isn't it? So I don't know if either of you has anything to say on this, but um, well, Varun, I mean, do, do you want to come in here, or or I have a a few things I can chip in with? Yeah, I mean, the fundamental thing, as you say, Jemima, and what. When you put it as starkly as you have, the fact that you've got something that's extremely volatile doesn't really function as a store of value in a unit of account, right? Doesn't doesn't yeah. serve as a payment method. A stable coin takes you one step further because it's at least stable, <clears throat> but it depends how you back it. And, yeah. and then, I mean, is it really getting to where you need to get to? Will people really have trust in it? Will it last? Yeah. And that's the real question. And 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 that's what obviously we've been saying this week, and the, the governor of Bank of England has been saying this week. Mm. Well, it's an interesting experiment, isn't it? Like, how many people are actually going to use this? Um, yeah, exactly. And how is it going to work? And like, how many businesses are going to go bankrupt because they've taken on this enormous risk by, like, taking a Bitcoin payment and then Bitcoin is halved in price and they've, like, transferred Bitcoin at the wrong time. And, you know, it's, there's, so many, there's so many hazards. And, and like you say, other countries around the world, if it's about inclusion, you go to m -Pesa and you think, you know, you don't need a, you don't need a basic phone, you need anything. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You can solve inclusion in different ways, absolutely. Yeah. It does strike me as strange, you know, to use it as financial inclusion. I mean, you, we've had a, um, 
we've spoken with um, Pierre Paolo, as, you, as you'll remember, Jemima. And I, that strikes me as genuine, you know, financial inclusion, you know, you know getting people on the app, getting uh, people into the financial system, you know, with a stable uh, sort of uh, financial service. Bitcoin, as you say, over the past four days, it's, it's just been headlines of, uh, you know, Elon Musk drives price up, Elon Musk drives price down. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, uh, just an unusual... Uh, Although, although you know, devil, playing devil's advocate, like yes, that's in, that shows how how manipulate m- m- um, manipulable Bitcoin is. But then you know, Ronaldo moved two Coca Cola bottles out of the shot, and the price of Coca Cola is like you know, billions of dollars have been wiped off the value of Coca Cola. Where are we living? Where are we living? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a funny time. Um, Going to continue through. Yeah, I'll move on. So uh, this is this story that's next on our list is a bit of a silly one. Maybe Bitcoin bros aren't really a thing after all. This was just because I was watching the videos and the tweets and the pictures out of Bitcoin 2021 conference in Miami, and I mean the absolute state of that conference. Like there was a there was a <laughs> there was a panel on Bitcoin uh, toxic ma- ma- maximalism, um, and it was like a pro, it was like a panel about saying how good this is. <laughs> and this guy gets gets up and he says, um, hang on, I've got the quote here. He says, not only do I think Bitcoin toxicity is important, I think it's absolutely necessary. And if you are against Bitcoin toxicity, you're against Bitcoin. And if you're against Bitcoin, you're against freedom, period. Um, you know, this kind of, this kind of, this kind of stuff. And then you had um, Max Kaiser, this, you know, uh, slightly deranged um, Bitcoin evangelist guy um, of the Kaiser report on on Russia Today, um, kind of getting up and saying, um, you know, fuck Elon, you know, excuse my French, uh, but that's what he said. Um, We're not selling, we're not selling. um, Again, it's a funny, it's a funny thing to say about currency, isn't it? Like we're not selling. Like that's the whole point of of, of money that you can that you can like spend it. But mm-hmm. clearly, we know that that's not the point of Bitcoin. But you know, so mm-hmm. it's all just entirely so. Just it's just all con- contradicts itself all, all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, there was it was just a very broish uh, festival, and um, like all the pictures were really funny. I was literally like looking. We had like you know all the photo agency's pictures and I was trying to find pictures of the conference and it was just like it's like men <laughs> it was really funny um and then all these like crypto women started getting all like that one of some of them found out about this this post and I started I've been getting so much abuse over the last the, the abuse that I've been getting on Twitter over the last week or so has really stepped up I'm not sure what's happened but I've been I've been getting some really quite vile um, messages and like just really? constant. Yeah, I've been spending quite a lot of time like muting people, muting conversations because it's just like really draining. Like I'm wow. just so much of it in the past week. Were, were they were they actually crypto women or were they just icons? Uh, some of them were, and then some of them were like fake women who you can just you go on their Twitter profiles. They've got like a female picture. Well, that's what I. Like, yeah. The tone of their tweets, without being like too like gendered, it's just very. Uh, seems very likely to me that they are not women, you know, like just the way they're tweeting. It's just like, that's just not a very female way. (laughs) Let's move on to Tom Tugendhat. Tom Tugendhat, who is um, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, so quite a kind of important Tory MP in the sense that he's got that kind of important role. Plus he was the co-founder of the CRG, which sounds a bit like the ERG and is in some ways, uh, you know, it's a China watch group within the Conservative Party, a bit like how the European Research Group um, was, uh, you know, this kind of Brexiteer wing. I mean, I don't think they would say that they're anti-China, but they are kind of, uh, I would say Tom Tugendhat is, 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 is kind of a bit hawkish on China. I think he, I think he does get described as a moderate. Anyway, not, we're not talking about China, we're talking about crypto. He, um, I think actually though, his views on China do kind of play into why he's, uh, it's not something that he said when I spoke to him on the phone, but I, I feel that this is kind of um, China is seen as really leading the way in, in central bank digital currency and in fintech in general. And I think um, there's a sense that we need to kind of that Britain needs to, you know, uh, keep up with like the Chinese and not let them kind of get ahead of us. And I feel like 
the way that he talks about crypto is somewhat in some ways kind of um part of that. He he got up during the Queen's speech debate, which was actually about housing, and started talking about the flipping, which is this hypothetical time in which the Ethereum market cap overtakes the Bitcoin market cap. And he kind of says this in Parliament and then boasts to like some crypto podcast that that's the first time this has been used in Parliament. Uh, and he says the Treasury needs to create a safe space for cryptocurrency development. And he's talked about making a safe space, like, you know, we should be welcoming exchanges and stuff. Anyway, he's very, I spoke to him and I, and I actually found him more measured than his speech and his his SoundCloud monologue that he's done on this would suggest. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm not quite sure. He, he, he doesn't seem to fully understand it, if I'm being kind of brutally honest. Um, the way he the kind of turns a phrase he uses just doesn't doesn't reflect a huge amount of understanding. I feel like he's kind of come to crypto fairly recently, but he's just just a kind of following on the kind of I've got a, a series on Alphaville called "What's the What's the Tory Crypto Story?" Just because there's been so many, there's just been so many Tories who've gone into crypto, and I'm not sure why they're he, all so enamored. He's not had a he's not had a position on any of the. Um... APPGs. No, no, he wasn't. Um, In fact, I asked him about the, the blockchain APPG and he hadn't even heard about it because mm. um, I told him that I'd had a run in with Grant Shapps and he didn't know that about that either. So mm. that's why I feel like he's quite new to this game. Uh, and, I, and I asked him if he holds any, any crypto. He says he holds about 500 pounds because I was suggesting it was a little bit unethical to get up in parliament and to kind of pump your crypto bags uh but he said it was only 500 pounds i mean i've got no way of checking that um so i have to take him at his word he hasn't declared it in his financial interests but um uh i guess it's low enough that it, if, if it is 500 pounds but i still think it's really unethical like as a journalist i wouldn't buy 500 pounds and start writing about something saying it's really great because also as we know the the um you know it's infinite the value that, that that any of these things could go up to is infinite right like bitcoin has has gone from zero to like forty thousand or however much like the maximum has gone to is like what is it now it's like almost sixty thousand or something I mean what percentage increase is that like <laughs> um so I just think it's kind of weird that he's doing this uh, but anyway I will I will move on because I'm because we want to get through the list. Uh, just quickly, quickly on Coinbase. Coinbase has set up a fact-checking service. It's getting upset about all the negative articles about crypto in the press. So it thinks the best weapon against this, you know, this fake news media is to uh, is to create its own fact-checking service, which is just like there's a lot to say on this. I mean, fact-checking, I have a lot of issues with anyway because facts are often more illusory than they might at first, kind of. Seem and I mean the coin, Coinbase is saying, oh, you know, we, we need to decentralize the truth, which is just a stupid phrase. It doesn't mean anything. It's a company. How could how on earth could a company decentralize the truth with its own kind of truths that it's baked up? It, it's one of its fact checks is about the way that Bitcoin is actually bad for the environment, but obviously it argues that it's not. Um, it says that actually Bitcoin can contribute to the fight against climate change, which is just like perpetuating this lie that's now been kind of put out into the, you know, all of these, it's, you know, it's so effective. Like it's like the Donald Trump uh, technique, isn't it? Just, you know, put out loads of untruths and, 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 there, and if you flood the, if you flood the ether with, um, well, sorry, ether is the wrong word in this context. If you flood the, um, the environment with, with, with all these untruths, it's actually impossible to, um, to combat all of it. Like it becomes, if, if you, if, if you, if you put out so many lies, you you can't as journalists or as kind of members of the public or or anyone else trying to trying to hold people to account. You can't go through each one and kind of factually kind of unpick it um, because it just takes too much time. And so it's quite an effective method. And obviously, with the way that algorithms work and stuff and social media, it's easy for these things to kind of circulate and stuff. So we've got this idea now that Bitcoin is actually good for the planet because it could use renewable energy. I mean, that's just like saying that any literally any industry. Um, is good for the planet. So like do more of it, do more everything because we can use green energy for it. And so therefore it must be helping climate change. So that's the, that's the kind of level of, uh, of kind of truth. Um, Should we let uh, Var Varun breathe a sigh of relief as we move on from the crypto uh, space? <laughs> Uh, I, I think the next one is fintech versus big bank and culture wars. Um, and I, I, I'll let, obviously let you do, run over this, Jemima, but I, just the context today, I don't know if you saw that um, JP Morgan bought Nutmeg or acquired Nutmeg. Yeah. Uh, so 
perhaps something to keep in mind for this. But yeah, I'll run it over to you. Well, it's just a piece um, in Sifted um, that's kind of arguing that whereas uh, banks and fintechs used to be kind of at each other's throats, that they are now kind of much more cooperative. Um, I think this has been happening for a while, but I guess it's a kind of trend that's 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 uh, become you know that's accelerated or whatever the jargon is. Um, if you look at the actual money, um, uh, money going into B two B fintechs actually overtook money going into B two C fintechs in 2020. Something that I've been saying for a while is that I feel that there's much more, um, uh, I've found it much easier to see the kind of business, the kind of uh, paths of profitability for the kind of B2B fintechs um, than the kind of too good to be true um, B2C fintechs, like all these neobanks that just want to give you everything for free and just don't seem to have any path to profitability and have never really made any money. Um, so it's, it's kind of not surprising to me um, that this is kind of the direction that things have gone in. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I think JP Morgan um, buying uh, Nutmeg is kind of another sign of, of that kind of working together rather than working against one another. Um, I'm not sure whether Nutmeg had ever managed to make any money, a bit like all of these consumer facing fintechs, but they've obviously got a really good brand. So for someone like JP Morgan, um, you can see the attraction. I think they're going to, Nutmeg is now going to be kind of that's going to be the umbrella under which all their um, non-US digital wealth management products are going to be held. So, um, yeah, I can I can kind of uh, see how that makes sense um, from from that perspective. I don't know if I have anything particularly more. Baron, no. Any thoughts, Baron? Um, yeah, I'm having some audio issues. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me. But um, I am. Um, yeah, I thought the article was really interesting. I'm just going to take the opposite view in a second, though, because in a way, we've always known this is coming. You've got these minnows and you've got these sharks, right? Uh, the banks are clearly bigger than the, the challenges and the competitors. They, the small firms were designed to disrupt. It was always going to come to this point where uh, when they became valuable enough, the banks would be able to, to snap them up. And, and the way I haven't seen the, the JP Morgan nutmeg tie up, but it, it could be spun the other way around. Like, um, you know, you've seen something that's valuable and you just buy it up. And, and that was always the way that when we looked at the future of finance report, when you think about how long these things have existed, they've existed because they have been able to buy up the challenges along the way, whether it's, you know, two or three hundred years some of these banks have existed. Yeah. So there was always that narrative that could happen, uh, whether it, you know, I, I do, however, believe that the future is a is a combination of the two because there's real value being driven and innovative. All the innovation is coming out of these small nifty startups. Yeah. So partnerships are right. But I, I'm not so sure that the the dynamic has changed in the way that it's described in the article. Yeah, I'm not sure it's like massive. I don't think it's been a massive shift. I guess there's been a kind of slight shift. Um, but I agree. I mean, and I also think that this is why, you know, I always bang on about this, but I also think that this is why London has quite a, an advantage, um, uh, like as a as a kind of hub for fintech, just because of our proximity to, or, or, or the, not our proximity, but, but the combination of kind of tech and the big banks, you know, and so as a fintech, you actually do quite want to be um, near, near those big banks. Um, so I will move on. Another kind of um, neobank sifted story is um, the kind of new challenges to the challenges. Uh, so the kind of new fintechs um, that are catering to the Generation Z, Gen Z, um, kind of under 23 year old market. Um, so there's a whole kind of host of um, apparently only 2% of Monzo's clients are under 18. So, you know, think of Monzo as like someone like Andrew would think of Monzo as like, the you know, the young person's uh, bank. And it kind of is in some ways. But the fact that 98%, I mean, I guess 18 is, you know, uh, is, is, you know, below 18 is, you know, you're not you're not a proper adult yet. So it kind of is not that surprising in some ways. But these banks like Revolut and Starling have both now set out um, set up accounts for like children. So they are trying to get the younger um, bits of the market. But there are now these these fintechs that are coming in to kind of challenge that. Um, looking at, you know, they're doing things like there's this there's this uh, there's this bank called um, or an app called XPO, which is um, an influencer payment app. It's weird how like Influencers are mentioned a few times in this article. It's weird how how big influencers are in that kind of world, isn't it? Like the TikTok, the kind of TikTok generation, um, 
where you're like, everyone's kind of their own brand. And it's like, these apps are reflecting that, like you are a brand, you know, like you as a young person are a brand and you, mm. it's just, it's a weird, it's, it's a bit, it's, it's, um, I find it a bit unsettling. Uh, apparently in, tw- in 2021, in April, 2021 alone, over half a billion dollars were plowed into um, Gen Z facing. I'm saying Gen Z. I don't normally say Z. I say Z. But I feel like when you say Gen Z, you have to say Gen Z. Do you? It's a bit like Jay Z. You know, Gen Z. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I feel I should say who's Jay Z as sort of representative of representing Andy. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Jay Z these days is, is pretty old, isn't he? He's yeah. like he must be. He must be over 50 is he I don't oh, know. Least. do you reckon yeah <laughs> yeah he no, can't be that old because he's he is maybe he is anyway um uh so so yes i don't know if there's much more to say i don't want to spend too long because i know that we've still got quite a few things to get through well, just, um, just quickly varin uh, i mean do what do you think of uh, you know the influence of culture you know targeting of the youth in in financial services how do you how do you see it well, in a, in a sense, there's, there's no getting away from it, right? Um, we are seeing greater and greater herding uh, to certain uh, trends or uh, activities and, and services. So that's going to be a feature of, of the financial system. Uh, in a way, you know, it's worrying if uh, we've seen the extreme end of it uh, in the crypto sphere, where social media is pushing people in one direction or the other. Um, and, and we've seen a fair amount of it happening uh, on, on investment platforms. So you've got to be, it's certainly, uh, it's a con- concerning uh, feature. But in this space, um, it, it's just new ways of appealing uh, to, to a younger audience. And I get that. I, I mean, there's that weird stat in, in the article about uh, a huge number, 35% of the population is under, under 23. It's a bit... Uh, disingenuous in a sense given that most of them are too young to, to use financial services and that's and it's also disingenuous yeah. it's also disingenuous because like most of those are in like africa and and maybe like yeah. Asia, but like we know that all of the population growth is now coming from like places like nigeria and like and we're not talking like we're not talking about that when we're talking about these like fintechs are we we're talking about like no exactly these aren't like, Af- like do, you, do you think this is a problem that is waiting to happen though because I, I mean i don't i'm i think i'm the youngest person here but i, I don't touch i wouldn't touch tiktok because i just don't understand it and i don't care but people who i mean financial services and that buy- surprises me greatly you scream tiktok <laughs> 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 yeah. you've got some dance moves out there probably not too late i mean i could have a look but it, you know financial services via tiktok i mean is that a realistic proposition down the line i mean is there oversight of that do you know do you know what i think i think we are moving to more greater and greater integration uh anything that i've looked at in the digital economy says that payments become part of you know they get hidden the financial system is all in the background and it's all kind of programmed in um there is there is a future that could look like that uh and and this is just part of that journey so absolutely i think the platforms uh, are are the way that uh financial services are going to have to be marketed um I would, what's clear though sorry. i was just going to say you need to have a bit of separation mm. for the sake of the consumer for their for their interests but i do understand why it's more and more integration is happening I, I would push back a tiny bit on that because I feel like everyone was saying that like 12 years ago or, or more, you know, with when Facebook kind of started becoming big and stuff and everyone assumed that like in, in no time everyone would be using, you know, millennials back then who were like the very young people back then, that they would all be in no time, you know, using, um, you know, Facebook to pay one another and stuff as 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 has happened in China. But I mean, like with Ch- in China, that kind of... Uh, they kind of front front ran that like they, they happened at the same time and i think once one has happened it's harder for the other to kind of integrate itself post facto or whatever and i'm, I'm not sure I, I necessarily agree that like yes things will become more integrated they or, already have been i mean even like amazon is an example of that you know the kind of ease of you know user you know the user experience the kind of the kind of seamlessness i think that's one of the reasons that Klarna has become so successful i mean the seamlessness of Klarna is insane um, and so, so, so I kind of agree to that extent, but I'm not sure that I believe that like 
there won't still be a demand for like boring financial institutions that kind of that you just trust because it, because do you really trust TikTok to like look after your money? I mean, I feel like lots of people just want something kind of boring and you see that with like, you know, so over the last decade, you've seen that, you know, Monzo and Revolut, et cetera, kind of trying to get people to like use those accounts as their primary accounts. And that's what they've really struggled with. People actually, people have used them. People like me have used them because it's like, I get free overseas money or I get cheaper transfers or, you know, whatever, or, you know, you get a nice thing, nice app that like tells you how much you're spending, but you don't actually get paid into it. So I just wonder whether we always imagine that things are going to become more integrated than they actually do. And that in some ways people actually want a bit of a, they want the kind of stodgy, boring, kind of just finance, plain vanilla thing to kind of, or maybe they'll just have their wallet at the central bank with their CBDC. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe. I think I think you're right. And the, the, the thing that I'd differentiate is that there is a whole spectrum, right? And I'm talking about the really simple things, the payment stuff, you know, the online shopping, which right. has clearly moved a lot in that 12 years. Yeah. There's a massive uh, gap between, you know, buying a, buying a house and having a mortgage and that product. Yeah. And the financial advice that you clearly want, uh, you wouldn't do that on TikTok. Yeah. Um, but, and, and, and this is saying that the, the, the one end of the spectrum, those who are really uh, clearly integrated using social media lots more, that is a way to, ta- to, to access that market. So I think there is a spectrum, but yeah, I totally agree. With I also, it's, not, it's not that kind of that quick. Yeah. I also thought just one final thing on this story. I thought it was interesting. I've forgotten where it was, but where someone said that like Generation Z um, kids are wanting like their apps to like um, reflect their values. (laughs) Um, I just find that also just so like, Jesus, what a time we have, like where we have this, like it's all, it's all very kind of surface level, isn't it? There was that amazing I don't know if you guys saw that amazing Chimamanda essay yesterday that was posted. Um, if you haven't seen it, Varun, it's it's very good. Um, mm. This Nigerian author who posted this this essay about scathing about what it was a scathing it was scathing of of, uh, of the of the youth today. Um, yeah, yeah. It was a kind of there was a personal account, and then there was a kind of the third section is is a uh, is yeah a very scathing attack of like the kind of social media culture of like faux compassion and like. Um, uh, you know, the way that we kind of attack, we, we pretend to be all kind of, want, can't, you know, it's all about kindness, but we just, we, we're like incredibly ruthless in the way that we kind of attack one another. Anyway, it, it's, it's worth reading, but um, I just thought that was an interesting part of it, that like that is also feeding into like even what you would want from like your financial product is kind of, um, kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so mm-hmm. moving on, we should, we should, I, I won't go through everything, Leighton, because we, we've kind of, I know we haven't got much time left. I think- I mean, if we could do the digital um, identity. Klarna together. Let's do, we do the two Klarna stories as one. Klarna together. Klarna together. So, um, so Klarna has, um, has, has, has uh, raised some more money and it has increased its valuation by 50% to just over $45 billion in the space of three months, which is kind of insane. Uh, and its uh, fundraising included fresh capital from SoftBank, SoftBank have made a bit of a kind of comeback uh, after having a terrible, <laughs> a terror. You know, back in like uh, early 2020, they were looking really, really, really uh, not great, were they? Um, and but then their kind of bets on like tech companies and stuff have obviously really paid off during the um, the pandemic. And apparently, um, there was a, there was I don't know if you guys saw there was a, there was a piece on SoftBank in the the Economist um, a few days ago, um, and uh, apparently. On the on on the um, earnings call on May the twelfth, um, Massa was um, boasting of having back tw- sixty companies in three months, and between January and March, he doled out two hundred and ten million dollars a week. So I think this is just as much a kind of SoftBank story in, in a way as it is uh, Klarna, because this was the, this was SoftBank's first investment in Klarna, uh, and it led the round. The round was six hundred thirty nine million. I'm not actually sure how much of that was SoftBank, but SoftBank was the biggest investor. Uh, so just really interesting. I mean, obviously US is a big market for them. And so that's where they're going to be, um, pushing into next. I don't think they've, they stopped being profitable, um, in, I think 2019, they think they'd been profitable until 2019 and then stopped being profitable and they haven't been since, but clearly they're like massively ramping up. But I think it's quite an interesting one to look at from the point of view of profitability, because like, I find them quite responsible, even though they get attacked a lot and which is what the second, um, piece uh, is about because they've got this advertising campaign, comparing themselves favorably to credit cards, which I think is a fair enough 
thing to say in some ways. Um, I mean, clearly they do incentivize people spending money they don't have. Like I've definitely done that with Klarna um, and I've never really done that with credit cards. And I feel like with credit cards, there's a kind of like, you feel like, oh no, I shouldn't get out of credit card because that's a bit of a like step into a territory that I might get onto some like dangerous, you know, I don't want to do that. Uh, whereas with Klarna, you're like, oh yeah, I don't have any money in my account. Let me just spend this 500 pounds that I don't have and I'll pay it next month, you know? And it's like, so this seamlessness makes it all seem so much uh, less scary in a way. Um, so I think that, but, but, but I do think that what's fair enough is that they're saying that they're very responsible in the way that they actually um, chase their customers to pay. So like you get a text and an email on the day that your payment is due being like, you need to, or the day before saying, just a reminder, you know, and I've forgotten before and I've been like really thankful that they've reminded me. And that's totally not the kind of payday loan model, is it? Like that's, it, so, so the way that they behave is definitely a big improvement on some of the kind of exploitative stuff that we've seen before. But I just wonder whether they've become so responsible that they're just not never going to really make any money now, because like, what is their business model? Like if they're, if they're, they're saying that like this guy gave this interview to, to sifted and I found it a bit disingenuous. He said, he said, we're offering this product to consumers interest free and fee free. And he added that the general lack of interest payments and fees means there is no incentive to lend to people who cannot afford to repay. I mean, that can't be true, right? Like you cannot, like, again, you can't, all this too good to be true stuff is just, you know, you, you always a red flag to me because that, that can't be right. Like they need to make some money somewhere. So clearly they do want people to not repay, but like they're behaving like they don't. So I don't know. I don't know if you two have anything to say, but I think that's an interesting one to watch. It's massive. Yeah. Five billion. Yeah, it is. It's really striking. I was just going to say a couple of things. One, obviously, the industry, the burner, pay later, has, has come under fire recently. And they're clearly trying to separate themselves as the more responsible thing. And as you said in the article, it kind of made clear that the steps they're taking. My understanding on, on their, their business model is that they're taking the fees from the retailer, right? So they're taking that yeah, card exchange fee. Yeah. And that's where they're making their money, as opposed to the credit card model, which is punish the, the, the buyer. That's- that's not that's not enough. They can't just no. Well, unless there is some huge scale that they're going to get to, uh, you, you're, you're right. The one the other point I was going to make was it goes back to the thing you said before about the integration. It's so seamless and it, it is pushing us in, in a direction. And actually, it just goes back to what you're talking about the mental health thing. Uh, you know, we've got to. It becomes so easy to to make these payments. We do have to worry about uh, where it's pushing us and whether whether all this kind of uh, following what you're sold on the internet or uh, or encouraged to do subliminally pushes pushes our younger generations in the direction we don't want to go so that's the kind of thing we're going to worry about but uh i i accept if they are doing as they say in terms of their business model being slightly different from the rest of the industry it's, it's one to watch also the card fees i mean like with Klarna, you're still using your card so so they're not getting the card interchange fees so i think the, the fraction that they're it's getting quite right. right exactly so they're just quite. getting but that that doesn't seem to be enough to justify the valuation or or for or to kind of provide a path to profitability. But I'll I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll move Just on. Just a, a very quick word on um you know the the IPO environment because Klarna is looking potentially for an IPO. I note that uh, Wise, formerly TransferWise, is looking for a direct listing in London, which is great for London. I mean. It, is, is it realistic that Klarna looks to us or is it a, a US proposition? You know, you mentioned their growth in, in the US. I think it will depend, won't it, maybe on um, on how its brand does in the US. I think it will, it would, if, if it becomes a really, it's, it's, it has had very rapid growth in the US, but it's still quite a small product. I mean, I don't know, but it's, it looks like it's between the US and the UK, doesn't it? I, I would imagine that that would, that there will be two things that would be dependent on. One being, the, I mean, it's, it looks like the US is a more attractive kind of place to list at the moment. It seems like valuations just like, you seem to get a higher valuation just by virtue of like being listed in the US. Um, clearly like the UK has now loosened up its listing rules, particularly um, for uh, kind of tech startups, kind of high growth um, kind of startups. Uh, so that might make it more attractive. And I guess that's still a little bit like, you know, that's we're still in early days of that, so I guess it's kind of too soon to to say. Really, I don't know if Varun has any 
any, any more insight? Well, just, just reading the why story, I mean, it sounded like uh, it, it would be the first direct listing in a long time in London. Uh, and so maybe maybe that's the thing. If that's a big success, Karana might look back to the, to the UK. But yeah, I've always agreed. It hasn't, it hasn't talked about doing a direct listing, has it? It's just said an IPO. But, but I mean, you think maybe it could even follow in the direct listing footsteps? I think it might, have, might be a direct listing. Um, I, may, I may have misread that. But, uh, Okay. Okay. So, should we move on? Should we just do one more? Should we do the digital I don't digital wallet? Because uh, we're a bit over time, aren't we? Otherwise. Yeah. Sure. Let's do yeah. that. Okay. So, um, so the EU is set to um, unveil this digital wallet fit for post-COVID life, says the FT. Um, so it's unveiled. Oh, it's set to unveil. No, I think it has now unveiled. Sorry. Uh, plans for this um, uh, European Union digital wallet um, that will allow. Um, citizens to secure their payment details and passwords, and they can log into both kind of lo local government websites and also company websites, pay utility bills, access their driving license, you know, apparently do things like, you know, turn up at an airport and you've already booked your, uh, your, your car. So you don't have to wait for, you know, wait in a, in a, in a car rental office and you go and you can, you know, straight away with your, with your kind of digital wallet, you can kind of access the car and all this fancy stuff, which I once was told was only possible via, you know, the power of blockchain and smart contracts. Um, so it seems kind of very, uh, and apparently this is all going to be up and running within a year, which which seems to me incredibly fast. And I would be, I'm, I'm a little bit dubious about. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, Varun, I think you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, so uh, I mean, this build the EU has got EIDAS, so it's building on something already. Um, so it has a leg up compared to where we are in the UK. So it's possible they do it quickly, but um, yeah, a year seems pretty ambitious. But wouldn't it be great if all that stuff was possible and you, you know you no longer no longer have to carry a wallet and lose your from about the change and all that kind of stuff? Um, well, I think the key thing for me is wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to remember passwords? And we talked about inclusion before. Uh, I think this is a, it's going to be a big step for the financial system when we can move to a, a digital ID that is trusted. And there's been loads of negative stories about identity and so on recently. Um, but there is there is a world in which it is decentralized. And, uh, in, you know, in the model we talked about open banking at the start, where I as an individual own my data and I can pull it from def different parts of the system when I want to share it. But it's, it's, it's not really duplicated. Really, it's not really decentralized, is it? Because if it's all held in an EU database, I mean, the EU are lucky that, like, the UK is no longer a part of it for something like this. Because yeah. We're so resistant to this kind of thing, and we we are always so worried about our kind of privacy and our civil liberties and all the rest of it. And I do worry about that, and I kind of worry Absolutely. about breaches and like how will they, you know, prevent? I mean, we didn't mention with Klarna; they just recently had a data breach where like ninety thousand people's date details were temporarily compromised, and like people's names and addresses and phone numbers came up. I mean, like, how does the EU have a superior, like, does the EU really have the kind of the best tech people in the world, like better than like all these startups? Like, can it really safeguard that so that like, there's never any breaches and like, you know, it's like incredibly, um, you know, uh, personal kind of details. Are, are they really gonna be, I don't know, I, 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 I do, Worry about that and then there's also the worry about like how much of our kind of liberties do we want infringed upon like how you know because clearly it will make it easier to like find a criminal you know through whatever they and, and so how much of our activity are we happy to be kind of tracked by the eu i don't know there are lots of questions aren't there um definitely and, and i think the key thing of what you said there is a central central register um that's why i was i was actually talking about the uk so what we're doing in the uk yes. So DCMS are trying to develop a digital ID trust framework. And the whole point about that is it is relying on existing parties to share data. Right. And it's, there is no central database. And that's crucial for me because that's when the individual is putting control of the data. And then no, no other part of the system has your entire picture. Oh, that so isn't... it's much harder for someone to, to steal your identity, but to hack that identity. It, and, is... and therefore, it's, it's more resilient. This, wow. this is similar to the Estonian X road. I mean, I don't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Similar idea, exactly. So, I so, mean, it, so... it reduces the risk of cyber threats uh, and problems going wrong. I mean, actually, how, how would that square with the Estonians who are a member of the EU? I mean... So, I think uh, if you read the article, I think the detail says that it's down to each, mem each member state and how they do it uh, and, and exactly when, when they do it. So, there is a bit of flexibility, uh, even in the European scheme. 
Um, but yeah, like you say, uh, we're in a position now where we can do our, our own thing. We start a couple of steps back because we, we don't have the kind of identification schemes that other countries in Europe have. Um, but I do think there is some potential here. What, what isn't helpful is when there are, there are stories of data leaks, you say, and, you know, we've got to be wary of that. Uh, but also when uh, some, some parts of the system are, are mis misusing data. So it's really important that we have the right standards in place to make this kind of thing work. But, but I, think, I think actually on this, in this, I think the UK government's making good progress on, on a kind of digital identity that would protect and enhance our privacy. And that's, that's certainly what I care about the most. Uh, I want to be in control of it. And, and actually, EU aside, I think what's going on in the UK, what I've seen, uh, is really positive. A final thought, Jemima? Um, I don't really have a final thought. Do I need a final well, thought? Well, I'll, I'll, in that case, I'll ask you, what are you looking at in the next month? Um, well, I'm, I'm looking at Cornwall because I'm going there for a week. So that's on my, that's the forefront of my mind. Uh, I'm, I'm writing about Bitcoin again. Um, and about, you know, whether, is it a Ponzi scheme or isn't? That seems to be a constant question. So I'm trying to get to the bottom of if it is a Ponzi scheme or not. I think it is. Uh, <laughs> albeit a headless one. Um, I'm still working on a story on a on a challenger bank that's got some some issues, but I'm not going to talk about it because I don't want to give away the game. I was meant to have done that already, but hopefully by next month. Maybe those well, are the things. I mean, we look forward to that. Uh, Varun, what are you working on over the next month? What are you look? What is Sorry. the bank looking at? Yeah, uh, I, I'll be off uh, over the summer as well. I've got some shared parental leave, but before that, I know I've got to deliver some some more work on the AI public private forum. That's going to be a really exciting bit of work. Um, and I'm certainly pushing more on this SME open data platform idea. So those, those are the two things for me. But uh, more broadly for the bank, uh, there'll be lots of engagement on uh, digital currencies, uh, given given all the publications, features in the last week. So, so lots before the summer break, certainly, I'm sure. Excellent. Well, thank you both very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and thank you all for watching. See you next month.